Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all had a great weekend. Um, the weather was okay, wasn't it? It was a little dreary. I feel like the sun's probably not gonna shine for a few more weeks or months. Uh, we're sort of in that zone where it's gonna be gray for like from now until about April, but let's do our best uh, to stay positive about the weather here. Uh, despite the fact that the sun almost never shines. Uh, we got a break coming up. That's right. I mean, you've got a break in about two weeks, don't we? I mean, we just got this week, we got next week, and then you're all on a fall break, a fall reading week or a fall slack week, or what is the official name of the break, by the way? Reading week? You plan to, are you supposed to be reading something during the reading week? I would read if I were on reading week. I would probably sit back and try to get, catch up on some reading. Um, I hope you're all gonna, I hope you've got something enjoyable to do, whether it's here uh, or elsewhere. Let's get started with the content for this week. Uh, so we've got a few topics to cover. Uh, the main two topics are to pick up on where we left off. We were talking about how memory can be enhanced by elaboration. That was kind of the final, uh, point that we tried to make, right? So you can rehearse things by maintenance rehearsal. You can rehearse things by saying them with an inner voice or uh, using your phonological loop working in the working memory system. And that that can help you remember things in the short term. But if you really want to remember things, you've got to elaborate on them. So what I want to talk about today is how that kind of elaboration can help, but it can also hurt in a couple of specific ways. So this will get us into the topic of memory for complex events, like uh, a whole range of behaviors that you might incur that you might uh, uh, start in a specific context. So context-specific behaviors, complex events, complex uh, schemas and scripts, uh, and also how that might lead into things like making mistakes, uh, falsely remembering something that didn't happen or forgetting details because they didn't fit with your schema. So let's get started. And then at the end of today's lecture, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the quiz that's coming up uh, and the exam that's coming up next week. So today, let's start off by talking about complex memory. These are all terms that are used in this lecture and are used in the textbook and different textbooks. Uh, and they refer to some specific things. So the first we'll talk about is schemas. Uh, a schema is a structured knowledge, is a specific kind of structured uh, knowledge representation. Sometimes the plural for schema, you'll see a schemata. Other times you'll see people like me say schemas because I just figured that's easier <laughs> than saying schemata. It means the same thing. It's whether or not you wanna use uh, the official plural, which is schemata, or you just want to be lazy and say schemas like I do. Scripts are a kind of schema that tend to have a really ordered uh, characteristic to them. So you do things in a certain order. You go to a restaurant, uh, you usually expect to behave in a certain order. You expect somebody to come and ask uh, to greet you. You expect someone to take your order, your drink order first, maybe appetizers, then you expect certain things to happen. Uh, and if they don't happen in that order, uh, it can violate some assumptions, which might make things stand out or might make you not remember them because they didn't fit into your default uh, assumptions. Then I want to talk about context. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about how all of these can lead to some memory errors. There'll be some examples of memory errors uh, throughout the entire uh, course. So let's start with talking about what a schema is. So a schema is a general knowledge structure used for understanding events and situations. So an event, for example, might be something like uh, what would happen at uh, HOKO, for example. Uh, that is an event, right? And you kind of know what to expect. What is the first thing you expect to happen on Saturday morning at eight o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock in the morning on HOKO when the day starts? What are the first things you would expect to happen if you like, if you enjoy the HOKO vibe? What are some expectations of HOKO? Drinking is an expectation of HOKO, right? And you expect things to happen at a certain time. When is the, when is the usual average beginning time for a standard Rothdale, Huron, Sunset area, HOKO type party? When do they usually begin? 
I'm not, I'm out of the loop. I don't engage in any of this sort of thing. So 9 a.m. So if they begin at 9 a.m., that's probably expected, right? Uh, a HOKO party that begins at 6 a.m. would be unexpected. Uh, that would not be part of your general expectation, right? So that's an event or a situation that might differ. This class, a lecture, for example, is, an exa is a great example of a specific kind of situation. Uh, the first time you were in a university lecture, uh, did you all begin university lectures online mostly? Was Western online when you started for many of you? How many of you started in person more or less? So your first university lecture, what did you expect? What did you do? Can anybody give me a quick recollection of your first university lecture, the very first lecture you attended? Does anybody remember that far back? It wasn't that far back. Yes. That's a great answer. So if you didn't hear the answer, you kind of base it on what happened in high school or secondary school, right? I mean, you don't really know what to expect in university. You just know that it's gonna be kind of like what you expect in a lecture. And maybe you went to a, a high school setting with uh, 30 students in your class. And now you enter a university lecture with 800 students in your class. You kind of assume it's gonna be nothing else to base your assumptions on. It's gonna be kind of the same, just bigger, right? So as you suggested, you find a seat. Uh, and then you expect the professor to start discussing something. And maybe you get out your laptop or your notebook uh, and you start taking notes. You probably didn't think about all of those things explicitly. You probably didn't think, okay, university lecture, first time here, I gotta remember what to do. What's the first thing I need to do? I need to sit, I need to sit in a chair. I need to look straight ahead. You don't remember those things explicitly. Uh, it's a series of behaviors in a series of orders. So you use these skip scripts and schemas uh, to help you understand a new situation or to help you understand a familiar situation. Every time you enter into this lecture, uh, most of you, I can tell, sit in pretty much the same seat or same general area that you usually do, right? Uh, and you might pull out your laptop in the same way you usually do. Uh, and a lot of these things are kind of the same. You have these uh, routines. Uh, they help you understand uh, and navigate, the, uh, navigate situations by allowing you to make predictions your experience and your familiarity and your memory for similar situations allows you to make predictions about new situations. Let's break down that definition. It's a general knowledge structure. So the knowledge means your personal knowledge. As you suggested uh, in the back, when you start a university lecture, uh, maybe the first time you entered into a university classroom, you just thought, well, it's gonna be kind of like high school. I'll just expand my expectations a little bit, but it'll be similar. That's your own general personal knowledge. General means that you encode information about the types of situations so that you can use it as broadly as possible. It wouldn't be very helpful to have a script or a schema for cognitive psychology lectures at Western uh, because that wouldn't generalize to other situations. So you might have a lecture schema that lets you generalize to other situations. If you attend a lecture at a different university, you would kind of know what to expect, right? So you want it to be general, your personal, personal knowledge, but structured in a way that's general that helps you make predictions. And then finally, it's structured and it's used for understanding. So by structure, we'll see on the next slide what I mean by that. Uh, you might start with default assumptions and maybe slots that you can fill information in, like fill in the blanks, for example. And it helps you understand things, put relatively less effort into trying to understand the situation that you're in so that you can make predictions and know what to expect next. Using the example of buying ice cream, there are lots of ways to buy ice cream. I wouldn't ask for a show of hands for how many people like ice cream. I assume a lot of people like ice cream, even if maybe dairy products, uh, for example, don't always agree as they don't with me. Uh, I still like ice cream, right? Um, I might buy it in lots of context. Uh, so when I think about how do you buy ice cream? You might buy ice cream at the grocery store. You might buy ice cream at Shopper's Drug. You might buy ice cream at a Dairy Queen type restaurant, or you might buy it uh, at a fair, or you might buy from a vendor. 
Uh, there's lots of different ways you can purchase ice cream. Uh, those are general assumptions, right? So we might have a schema that helps you understand all of these things. And each one of these slots depends on the context in which each one of them is filled. So for example, for any scenario or schema in which you're gonna purchase ice cream, you gotta have somebody who buys it, right? There's a buyer, that could be you, that could be someone else. So we start with that basic assumption, buying ice cream requires somebody to buy it. Uh, you've got an item, there are certain kinds of items that you could purchase. Now, here's where it gets contextual. Depending on whether or not you're buying an ice cream cone, maybe an ice cream sundae or a pint of ice cream, it's gonna have some implications about some of these other slots. It's gonna limit the number of things that you can fill them in. Uh, so you are purchasing some kind of ice cream. Maybe there are flavor limitations depending on where you purchase them. Maybe the flavors depend on uh, what kind of person is selling it. And maybe the kind of person that's selling it uh, depends on what kind of thing that you can purchase and also has something to say about the cost. Uh, so these things are interdependent. Once you fill one of these slots, uh, you, can you can limit the number of things that you can fill in the other slots. And that's what I mean by predicting what's coming next. So if you purchase, um, if you purchase, that's me, John, an ice cream cone in vanilla from a vendor, I might expect something in the three to five dollar range. Let's say this is a vendor at a fair. Uh, maybe I would spend less if I were purchasing the same amount of ice cream at Shopper's Drug and then scooping it myself. Maybe I would expect to pay more if I were going to uh, a Dairy Queen or uh, something like that. Maybe I would expect to pay even more if I were at a vendor at Grand Bend uh, in the summer, right? So all of these things are interdependent. Does that make sense? So the schema is used to generate expectations. By generating expectations, you can fill in these slots uh, with the correct information. And each one of these slots is interdependent. It, the more limiting you can do, the more effective this schema can be. But what are some of the downsides of having a schema like this? Once you've limited some of the information, if something violates the assumption, it might mean that you don't notice it. Or if something violates the assumption, it might mean that you uh, make the wrong prediction. You make the wrong uh, you fill it in with the wrong information. And if you make the wrong prediction or if you fill it in with the wrong information, then perhaps you're more likely to make a memory error. You're more likely to forget what happened. Because what you probably remember is the usual uh, slot, or the usual filler for that slot, the usual assumption. If something differs, uh, then you're likely to make that mistake. Just to make a small uh, nuanced distinction between schemas in general and scripts in particular, uh, you'll sometimes see the uh, term script used to apply to a schema that's very dependent on the order. So buying ice cream, yeah, there's kind of an order that you expect, but it isn't the case that it's very order dependent in the same way uh, that maybe going to a restaurant might be. So maybe going to a restaurant, uh, you would imagine things to unfold in a particular order. Maybe you have a script for fast food restaurant versus fine dining. Uh, each one of these might be part of a larger schema for going out to eat. Uh, but the script itself might keep track of what order things are supposed to be in. When you eat at a fine dining restaurant, you expect things to unfold over a course of maybe an hour or an hour and a half, right? And you expect someone to take your order and to bring your food in a particular order. When you uh, purchase food at a fast food restaurant, you might expect to place the order at the counter and stand there and wait until it's finished. So for all of these, and what we're gonna see in a few uh, slides is that we often recall false items, whether it's for a script or for a schema uh, that is typical. So if we're going to make mistakes, we're probably going to make mistakes because we recall things that we expect to be there, even if they weren't there. So what happens when some of these uh, default assumptions are violated? It can result in better memory. So if something happens that's really outside of the expectations, but also very surprisingly 
outside of the expectations, it might be more memorable. I guess an example would be if something really unusual happened in a lecture. Uh, if, you know, let's suppose this whole screen fell <laughs> right now. Now, if I could, if it actually did right now, that would, I feel like I would want to know how that was planned. Like, do I, do I have power? Uh, suppose the entire sli uh, slide or you know, screen fell down in the middle of the lecture. You'd probably remember that, and that is not part of your schema. That is not part of a script, right? That's a completely unexpected event. There's no slot that that can fill into, right? You do not have a slot for uh, things falling down in the middle of lecture. So that might be remembered. However, uh, what probably wouldn't be remembered would, things, would be things that uh, sound as if they're plausible, or maybe things that don't quite fit or things that aren't necessarily striking or surprising or that grab your attention. Those things probably won't be remembered. Even if they're really out of place, they might not be remembered if they don't grab your attention. So when we hear, when we enter into a situation that requires a schema or a script in order to understand complex events and complex uh, interactions, we generate these expectations and we fill the expectations. How are they activated? Usually a schema is activated by being in the appropriate context. I mean, a restaurant schema is gonna be activated when you walk into a restaurant. A lecture schema is gonna be activated when you walk into uh, a lecture hall. Or there might be key words, uh, specific uh, concepts that help you think about things in a particular way. The activation of a schema affects your ability to encode the information. Uh, so you tend to, uh, if you walk into a restaurant, you would expect restaurant-like things to happen. And so you might miss things that you don't expect. Have you ever been in a situation where you run into somebody that you know, but out of context? It probably happens all the time, right? I mean, you might see somebody that you know from work, uh, but you see them in a completely non-work-related context. Or worse yet, have you ever run into somebody that you know, maybe from work or from university, but like on vacation, uh, way outside of where you would expect to see them. And it's not even somebody you know very well. Uh, and then you're, you've are you got to, like, is that really somebody I know from work? Oh, I don't want to talk to them. I'm on vacation. And so you have to pretend to not see them. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I mean, right? So completely, uh, you know, you're out of the context. You're not expecting to see that person. So you might miss them or you might not know how to uh, interact with them outside of the appropriate context. This is an example from a study uh, from a couple of researchers, Bransford and Johnson, uh, who were really interested in complex memory. Uh, so in this particular case, um, hold on for a second here. Do I have the next slide that I was looking for? Am I using the wrong slides? Have, have you noticed, is there anything out of order? There's supposed to be a photograph in here. And I'm thinking that, did I miss the wrong ones? Speaking of context and slides. Oh, it's up there. Okay. I must have moved it this morning. You know, this is, by the way, this is part of the problem with lecturing on the same material from year to year. I like to keep mixing things up. And so I added some new information here, but I added it a little bit later than I expected. So when I put it in this morning, I was like, oh, I'd like to talk about this later. I expected there to be a picture to come up. The picture's still here. I'm using my schema or my script for today's lecture to generate expectations for what slide is coming next. And all of a sudden, I, I had violated my own expectation from a lecture that I created and updated just this morning. Uh, so that should go to show you how malleable this lecture is. Let's go back to where we were. Pretend that didn't happen. Uh, let's just assume that the professor knows what they are talking about. And let's uh, hide floating meeting controls. All right, are we back on, can you just pretend that none of that happened? I thought that, I thought that the picture of the office was coming before this example and it's coming after the example. Uh, Bransford and Johnson, that's what, that's what we were trying to talk about. Bransford and Johnson were interested in whether or not people could pick up details from stories. 
Uh, now, stories are really easy and interesting to ask people to remember because most of us, when we're shown a long piece of information, complex events, a story or a narrative or a bunch of sentences, it exceeds the working memory capacity, right? You cannot use rehearsal memory to remember this sentence or to remember this paragraph, right? You could barely do it to remember uh, an entire sentence. So what we do is we remember the gist of something. We remember the meaning and we usually fill in with what we already know. So if you're asked uh, to read the following paragraph, and this is what Bransford and Johnson did, uh, subjects read the paragraph uh, and then they are asked to recall as much as possible. You can do this with recall. You can also do it with recognition by asking them to recognize specific statements or propositions. And I'll do a different example in just a bit. So if you, if you ask them to say the view is breathtaking from, one, from the window, one could see the crowd below. Everything looked extremely small from such a distance, uh, but the colorful costumes could still be seen. Everyone seemed to be moving in one direction in an orderly fashion, and there seemed to be little children as well as adults. The landing was gentle, and luckily the atmosphere was such that no special suits had to be worn. At first, there was a great deal of activity. Later, when the speeches started, the crowd quieted down. The man with the television camera took many shots of the setting, shots of the setting and the crowd. Everyone was friendly and seemed glad when the music started. Uh, so given the context and the schema, now, you don't have to have ever been watching a peace march or a peace rally from the 40th floor of a building to probably be able to activate a reasonable schema, right? So even seeing the sentence or the paragraph heading, watching a peace march from the 40th floor probably generates some expectations, right? You expect there to be people, you expect them to look small because you're up at the top of the building, uh, you expect maybe songs or speeches or uh, media coverage, that kind of thing. You know what a peace march looks like. You know what a demonstration looks like. You know what things look like when you're 40 or so floors uh, up above. And so people generate an expectation and they expect things to fit in. Uh, when they're asked later to remember as much as they can from this story, uh, one of the things most participants miss, they either fail to recall or fail to recognize, are sentences like this, uh, that the landing was gentle, and luckily the atmosphere was such that no special suits had to be worn. So this comes from a different paragraph, a paragraph or a story about landing on a different planet. Uh, and so you can imagine that this is something that most people would just gloss right over. Uh, it doesn't fit with the expectations. It doesn't fit with what you expect. Sometimes it does. And that's the tricky things about the schema. So the question was, can it ever go the other way? Can something stand out so that you would notice it? Yes, uh, sometimes things can violate your expectations in a startling and surprising enough way that they have their own additional piece, you know, own additional information. There's something distinctive and salient about them. That was the example that I gave about perhaps maybe the, uh, you know, the screen falling. That would be surprising enough that most people might notice it. Uh, what Bransford and Frank showed, and what we'll see in another example, is that if these kinds of things uh, are close but just don't fit, we don't have a place to put them in memory. And so without having a place to put them in memory, we don't encode them. And without being able to encode them, we don't seem to be able to recall them. That's a good question. Uh, did somebody else have their hand up? I thought I saw a hand up somewhere. Is that clear? However, sometimes uh, you can show that additional information that is inconsistent with the schema or ambiguous can be encoded and can later be revealed by asking participants to examine their memory from a different perspective. So the Bransford and Johnson example suggests that people aren't encoding it. They're not encoding it because they don't have a place to put it. They don't have a place in their schema or their knowledge structure to fit that information about the landing and the gravity and the atmosphere uh, and the special suits. It doesn't fit with watching a peace march. In a later study uh, by uh, Amy Pritchard and John Anderson, uh, participants were asked to read passages about two boys walking through a house. And they were given context. In other words, they were given a schema prior to reading it. The idea being that the schema would help you remember the information. Once you have a schema, you have, uh, you have some context and maybe you have a, 
an existing theme. Maybe you have some existing memory and it helps to you to elaborate, right? The whole point is to elaborate on this information. So some of the subjects were asked when they read this, imagine that you are a burglar. Uh, you're someone who's going to later break it. You, you're somebody who breaks into houses and steals things, right? Uh, it's not a, not a respectable line of work to be in, but just imagine, and this again, you don't have to have ever, I won't ask for a show of hands for how many of you have ever burgled a home, but you don't have to have ever burgled a home to imagine the kinds of things you might want to pay attention to if you're a burglar, right? That's what imagination is all about. Um, or imagine that you're a home buyer. You don't have to have ever purchased a home to know the kinds of things that people might pay attention to when they're purchasing a home. Does anybody ever look through uh, listings on Zillow or House Sigma and then imagine what it would be like to own that house? I'm sure you have from time to time, but you probably haven't looked through home, House Sigma or Zillow to look to think, what if I were going to break into that house? What are the things that I would want to pay attention to, right? But you could imagine next time you go uh, online to look at homes and real estate sites, imagine that you're a burglar. See if things look different. That's what Anderson and Pr Pritchard and Anderson were asking their participants to do. So this is really long. Let me just highlight a few parts of it. So the two boys ran until they came to the driveway. See, I told you today was good for skipping school. Mom is never home on Thursday. Who is that information important to? Burglar, right? This is important for the burglar, right? Nobody's home on Thursday. Tall hedges hid the house from the road, so the pair strolled across the finely landscaped yard. Tall hedges hiding it, that's kind of good for the burglar, right? Uh, but maybe that's also important for the uh, home buyer because it's beautifully landscaped, which is also important for the burglar, suggesting that there's money uh, there. I never knew your place was so big, said Pete. Yeah, but it's nicer now than it used to be since Dad had the new stone siding put on and added the fireplace. Big is probably important for both, right? But says different things to people who are looking to burgle the house versus people who are looking to buy the house. Siding makes no difference to the person who's probably trying to break in. Front and back door led to a garage which is empty except for some bikes. They went to the side door. Here's a really bad one. Mark explained that it was always open in case his younger sisters got home earlier than their mother. That doesn't really say anything for the prospective home buyer, but that's key information if you're planning to break into the house, right? That not only is somebody missing on Thursday, uh, but there's a door that's going to be left unlocked. Um, and so as you can see, we go on down, uh, you know, this already starts to sound a little sketchy. Uh, don't worry about the noise. The nearest house is a quarter of a way. This already sounds like the beginning of a horror movie, right? Uh, there's... There's a warning here, don't go in because no one will hear. Uh, Pete felt more comfortable, I'd feel less, observing no houses could be seen in any direction beyond the huge yard. That's sort of sinister already. Um, so there's valuables, but there's also information uh, about, um, you know, he's bragging about the jewels in the bathroom and all this kind of stuff, but there's a leak in the ceiling, which doesn't make any difference for a burglar. So lots of information that's probably interesting to both. What would you predict? If you're given the burglar schema, you're probably going to remember that information, right? You're going to remember the fact that nobody's home on Thursday. You're going to remember the fact that there's a door that's unlocked. And you're going to remember the fact that there's a lot of uh, jewelry in one particular room. And if you're looking to buy the house, you're going to remember that there's new uh, stone siding and a new fireplace, but there's also a leak uh, in one place uh, in the bedroom. So some of that information is really interesting to home buyers. Some is really interesting to burglars and people remember the information that you expect them to. That's consistent with the schema. However, the interesting thing about this study is that people were then told to imagine the same story after they had read it from an alternative perspective. So you just told me everything that was important about real estate and home buying, but imagine that you were a burglar and you read that same story. Were there any other details uh, that you think were interesting? And what they found is that people could remember additional details that they seem to have forgotten or missed the first time around, which suggests that the problem with schemas and the limitations with schemas and memory isn't solely about encoding, that it's a combination of encoding, elaboration, and recall. Now, if you ask these participants to recall the information a week later, uh, they might have lost the information that's inconsistent with their schema. They almost certainly would have. But in this case, they were able to recall new information 
by reframing their existing memory. That's kind of the power of this elaboration process that uh, once you start elaborating on things, once this information spreads, if you continue to reactivate it, uh, to remember things and to think about them and to continue to elaborate on them, you can keep some of those associations active. So people didn't miss the information when asked afterwards and when given this additional schema, it reactivated some of those spreading activation links. In this case, it suggests that the memory is quite flexible. You can remember new information, which also suggests that you could probably remember information that was never presented at all. So if you're given information, suppose you were uh, asked to come up with an alternative or a third schema, one that didn't have any information that was there, you might also falsely remember things uh, because they match with some of what was presented, but also uh, match with the new schema that, that you were given. And that's what I wanna sort of talk about over the next few slides. So why do we make memory errors? This is something we talked about early uh, in the uh, section on memory. Why do we have, why would we have memory? Uh, if it's so imperfect. And I suggested that uh, when we do make memory errors, it's because we actually have a benefit uh, for stretching the truth. There's actually a benefit for elaboration. There's a benefit for generalization. So we don't necessarily need a perfect record of the past. What we need is a record of the past that is really flexible, like the participants in Pritchard and Anderson's study. So a record of the past that maybe reflects uh, what's good for burglars, but when asked to reconsider it from a different perspective, you can also get new details. And you could easily see how that can be used against you uh, to suggest that you would remember things that were never presented uh, at all. And we talked about these, I won't go through these in all in great detail, um, but we talked about these at the beginning of the memory lecture, right? Transience and absent-mindedness, uh, ways in which things aren't remembered, blocking and misattribution and suggestibility ways in which the information is retrieved, but not retrieved in the right way. Uh, things like bias, in which you might uh, assume uh, the, the tendency for knowledge and beliefs to distort the recollection of previous experiences and persistence, the ability of some of these memories and some information uh, to stick around even if you don't want it at all. So on the next slide, I think this is where the picture is, right? Uh, so on the next slide, I'll show you a short picture. Uh, let's look at it for about 10 seconds. And I want you to try, you don't have this on your slide, do you? Okay, that's where this all came up. Sometimes I like to remove some of the slides from your slides, like I failed to do last week, uh, so that I can actually do the demonstration without you having the answers right in front of me. So I wanna show the slide for about 10 seconds. Try to encode as much information. So use whatever strategy you wanna use. Uh, use visual spatial information, try to remember where things are, remember what objects are present. And then on the slide after that, uh, there'll be a link that you can click on either your phone or your device, whatever you have, uh, that should take you to a quick survey where you can type in as many things as you remember, just use a comma maybe to separate them. So let's look at the picture. Try very hard to remember as much as you can. I'll even give you a schema, it's an office. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? All right, have you encoded everything? You've got everything there. Uh, on the next slide, you should have this slide. Click here. Uh, if you, is everybody, can everybody click on this link? And just type in the box as many things as you possibly can.
All right, if you haven't finished, go ahead and submit some things and we can take a look at some of these. How many of you felt like you really couldn't, how many of you felt like you could really remember everything that was there if you needed to? Uh, if you were to describe this scene to a law enforcement agent uh, or a detective uh, for a crime that had been committed, would you feel confident in your ability to be able to describe the contents of that room? How many of you would feel reasonably confident in being able to describe at least half of what was there? And if you made mistakes, do you think you would make mistakes by putting things in or by leaving things out or a combination of both? How many of you have an opinion on that? Both? Yeah, I think both is probably accurate. And what what's likely gonna happen, now this is actually a very poor looking word cloud here because it's only listed several things and I don't know how to make this any more specific. Let's update it a little bit here. Uh, and let's go ahead and look at sort of individual responses. Um, why don't we just go ahead and let's see if we can do a summary link here. What happens if I present all responses? Okay, so let's go back and look to see what's here. First of all, let's, um, what do we got here? There's some very highly specific, somebody listed a skull. There is a skull. Um, there's a bottle of wine. Uh, somebody mentioned some uh, coffee in a coffee pot and possibly a packet of sweeteners. I did see that somebody said a package of sweetener. Is that a package of sweetener or is that just your imagination if you wrote that? I mean, that's a reasonable assumption, right? So mostly what you're doing is you're using your knowledge and your experience to fill in the details. Um, of particular interest to the researchers in this study, uh, one of the things that they asked uh, in follow-up studies was, did you see any books? Uh, how many of you think you saw books there? Uh, it's not the most common uh, answer, uh, but it did show up. Monkey doll? Where is the... Oh, okay. Yeah, there is a thing. There is some kind of... I wouldn't have been the term... Wouldn't have been the words that I would have chosen for that, but... Um, Lysol wipes. So everybody's got some specific stuff. However, uh, if you do look down, somebody's really uh, in, in detail here. Uh, a lot of us um, did mention things like books because you expect books to be in an office, right? It's a graduate student office at a university. There's a typewriter, uh, there's coffee, there's pens maybe, I think there were pens. Uh, and so it's not unreasonable to think that there would be books in an office like this. And so what the researchers found is that many people false alarmed when they were asked uh, to identify specific objects uh, or in a recall setting like this, uh, often remembered things that weren't present. So it's one thing to forget. And it's one thing to not be able to remember some of the details, but it's a different kind of memory error to think that you saw something that you didn't. Uh, and that's what I want to spend a little bit more time talking about is when you think you see something but you didn't actually see it. So what would be a good explanation for why you would expect there to be books in this place? How many of you falsely recognized or remembered uh, books uh, or something else that wasn't there? So if you did, what would be the answer? Perfect answer. So based on your schema, it would be very fitting uh, to expect there to be books. Uh, and so although you didn't have time to get everything labeled properly, uh, it's not unreasonable to assume that books would be there. That's exactly what schemas are used for, by the way, is to be able to make predictions. So you want to know what's going to be in this office. I've only seen the office for a few seconds. I expect there to be books here, and I think I know where the books would even be. They would be on the bookshelf, right? Uh, so you kind of can imagine using your schema where those things would be. It cuts down on the basic information processing that you need to do uh, when you're in a situation like that. Uh, so what we see in all of these places um, some of this stuff is going to be there, uh, but here is another one where there's books uh, where they weren't listed, or they're listed, but they weren't actually there. Um, there was no laptop uh, in this particular case in this study that was done in 1975. Uh, there is a typewriter, uh, however, which is, I guess, laptop-like. Uh, so you can imagine that we're just using our schema. We're using our general knowledge uh, to imagine what was there. Now that's fine. That's exactly what you expect your, what you would expect to do in a situation like this. But that could be a problem if you're counting on your memory to be accurate. If you're counting on your memory to be accurate or someone else's memory to be accurate and their memory really isn't their memory but their memory is just their best guess for what occurred based on what they already know, 
That's a really different kind of question, isn't it? You would expect someone's memory to be accurate. You don't expect someone's memory to just be them making stuff up based on what they expect to be there. But it turns out that's a lot of what your memory actually is, is making stuff up based on what you expect to be there uh, because of your knowledge. Let's take a look at some of these other things. All right, so here was our picture. Uh, there's no laptop, there's no books. Uh, there's also a couple of strange, I do not understand why this graduate student has a whole box of wine uh, and a bottle of wine on their shelf instead of books, but this is not a student in my lab, so. So why do we have these kinds of memory errors? Let's give a couple of examples, and then we'll do another example of a kind of memory error, and we'll talk about two different kinds of memory errors, intrusion and distortion errors, both of which occur uh, oftentimes simultaneously. Uh, an intrusion error is when something that didn't happen intrudes, and a distortion error is when you remember the thing that happened, but you remember it in a different way. Maybe you remember it bigger or smaller or more intense or a different color. Um, connections that we make between things in elaborative encoding or any kind of encoding, whether it's using a schema, a script, or an elaborative rehearsal mechanism, these connections serve as retrieval paths, right? Uh, so if you associate things together, you're more likely to retrieve them. So when you saw that picture, uh, you saw some of the things you would expect to see in an office, right? You knew that it was an office. You activated your office schema. Uh, you activated knowledge about offices. Yes. Yes, definitely. I have several slides later which define those in bold terms. Great question. Question was, can I elaborate on distortion and, and uh, intrusion errors? Yes, I will be elaborating on those uh, in more detail. Intrusion, new inf information that did not occur intrudes. Distortion, information is recalled, but it's re recalled in a different way. And I do have those defined. Um, these connections can also lead to memory errors. And so any kind of shared connections make similar memories less distinguishable or less distinct. As an example, let's suppose that you have a general sense of knowledge. We're gonna call this spreading activation. Now I'll talk more about spreading activation on Wednesdays and next Monday's lecture. But for now, spreading activation is one of the dominant, let's just define it as one of the dominant theories for how long-term semantic memory is stored. It's a spreading activation network. So you have a memory for a beach trip. In California, on a summer break, you built sand castles, you went surfing, you were eight, and it was warm and sunny, as it often is when you're at the beach. Uh, you also have memory for a summer camp in Montana when you were 10, but it was also summer break, and it was also warm and sunny, and you also went swimming. You have a memory for a family reunion, uh, which also involved swimming, it was during spring break, and you were 15, and it was warm and sunny as well. So all of these things are probably combined, right? They're different memories. One was a trip, one was a camp, and one was a family reunion. One was eight, one was 10, one was 15, but there's some overlap. Two things happened during summer break. Two of these things involved swimming. Two of these things involved California. Uh, and there are some connections among some of these concepts. All of them were warm and sunny. And what is easy to happen is that as these connections are strengthened when you remember th things, is that you might start to draw some of these other links to the extent that the beach trip memory uh, is a summer break, warm and sunny California memory, and the family reunion is a California warm and sunny swimming memory, it's not unreasonable to start connecting that with your summer break. And once you start confusing the memory for family reunion with your summer break, then you might start confusing it with some of the other memories. Uh, so the thing that would help you remember these things, the elaboration or the activation or the density of this semantic network, the more connections, the better you're able to recall this information. But when those things start to overlap, it makes them hard to distinguish. Now, I will have more to say about this overlapping and lack of distinguishing effect when we have our Monday lecture. But for now, I wanted to introduce the concept so we can help explain some of these false memory effects. So next week, I'll talk about uh, spreading activation uh, and how it can help and hurt. Today, I just want to introduce the idea of spreading activation 
Uh, and the idea that some of these connections may not be there. They didn't happen to you, but because there are so many other things drawing this memory and this memory together, you start to create other associations, associations that didn't exist at all. Does that seem clear to everyone? Understanding things uh, usually helps memory, but it can also hurt your memory. Uh, here's another example from studies that were done uh, in the 1970s, again, looking at things like memory for narrative and memory for stories and memory for scripts. In this study, uh, this is Nancy at the cocktail party. Uh, for some reason, they were obsessed with cocktail parties uh, in, er in early cognitive psychology. This has nothing to do with the cocktail party effect. This is just Nancy at the cocktail party. Um, so everybody reads this uh, paragraph. So there's two different conditions. One condition is the control condition. You read the paragraph. The other condition is the theme condition, which I'll show you in a minute. They're also going to read this paragraph. And your job is to remember stuff from this paragraph. Nancy arrived at the cocktail party. She looked around the room to see who was there. She went to talk with her professor. She felt she had to talk to him, but was a little nervous about just what to say. A group of people started to play charades, of course. Uh, Nancy went over and had some refreshments. The hors d'oeuvres were good, but she was not interested in talking to the rest of the people at the party. That describes 100% of my party experience. Um, after a while, she decided she'd had enough and left the party. Again, <laughs> describes most of my party experience. This is not a very interesting story, right? So if I ask you to remember the events, you would say, well, Nancy was at a party. There was some hors d'oeuvres, she didn't feel comfortable, the professor was there, she left. That's kind of what happened, right? That's the gist of the story. This is not a very interesting story, but some of the subjects had a theme ahead of time which made it a much more um, scandalous story. In the theme condition, other participants read the same passage, but they read a paragraph as a prologue to give some context. Nancy woke up feeling sick again and wondered if she were really pregnant. How? Would she tell the professor she had been seeing? And the money was another problem. So now it's a much more scandalous story, right? Uh, now, when you go back to view this, well, it all makes sense. She was nervous to talk to, the, to her professor. Uh, she wasn't interested in eating because maybe she woke up feeling sick again and she didn't want to talk to these people because she was worried about stuff and the money was another problem, right? So all of this takes on a more scandalous and possibly more uh, serious tone. And the reason is, now this stuff makes sense. Now there is a reason for some of these things which kind of seems sort of bland on the surface of it, right? She went to the party, professor was there, there's charades, uh, there's hors d'oeuvres and so on. And what they found, what the researchers found is that when they were given this prologue uh, that gives this kind of scandalous setting to it, uh, they asked people to remember things. In the theme condition, uh, participants remembered more information, not surprisingly, right? They could remember more things, more, in this case, you're just asking them to study uh, which propositions, facts. So you ask, did this happen? Did this happen? Uh, and participants are uh, identifying propositions or facts that occurred in that story. So with the context, they can remember more information because now they have a story to fit it into. However, there's a downside as well, and that is that they inferred things that did not happen. So not only did people who were given the theme remember more information, they also falsely remembered more information information that they had inferred. In other words, they were more likely to remember implied information like the professor had gotten Nancy pregnant. The professor she had been seeing, which was part of that prologue, uh, the fact that she was pregnant, possibly, which was part of the prologue, but the prologue didn't mention the link between those two. But most people, many people made that error. Uh, so that was an error that was inferred uh, by people who were given the context. Now, this idea of inferring things and remembering them falsely, what does that remind you of from last week's lecture? It was a term or a specific effect that we talked about that seemed to enhance some kinds of episodic 
or semant some kinds of episodic memory, but not implicit memory. Does anyone remember the term? If I gave you a hint, it began with a G. It's a generation effect. Uh, so the generation effect is one in which you generate the answer. By generating the answer, it becomes part of your memory, right? You now have made that conclusion. You've made that inference. And the generation effect on explicit memory is that it enhances explicit memory. Something about doing the extra cognitive work to create those associations and to generate the answer means that it stands out. It's very distinctive. You can remember that information. However, if you generate something by inferring it and it didn't happen, then your brain gets confused. From your brain's perspective, this information was present, presented to you. It just wasn't something you read. It was something you inferred, but your brain doesn't always know the difference. All your brain knows is, well, I, I was exposed to the idea that the professor and Nancy, professor got Nancy pregnant, right? That was a thought that entered into my mind. Uh, that's something I'm gonna remember. So your brain doesn't has a, does a terrible job of distinguishing whether you read that information or inferred that information because the ideas were still there. The spreading activation was still there uh, and the links were still there. Does that seem clear? So this elaboration that comes from giving the context and the right schema helps, definitely helps here, but it also hurts a little bit. Let's try one more example. So in this final example, uh, we're gonna generate, uh, try to generate a false memory in everyone here. Uh, so I'll present to you, you shouldn't have these words to you uh, on your slides. I'll present to you a list of words. I'm gonna read them out loud and you can read them to yourself as we go through them. And then you're gonna see as usual, a link. Uh, this link will take you to a recognition test where you will indicate yes or no, was that word on the list that I studied? Does that seem clear? Let's go through the list. Fear, temper, hatred, fury, happy, enrage, emotion, rage, hate, mean, ire, mad, calm, fight. And there's a list. Now indicate which words that you think you saw. I'll give you another minute here. All right, so the question was, um, when trying to remember the list of words, you were then given a recognition task. And your job was just to indicate, yes, I saw the word. No, I did not see the word. And we should see high agreement here, right? We should see high agreement for one, for a couple of reasons. First of all, it was not a long list, right? Uh, second, uh, did, what was the theme of the list? Emotions and kind of negative emotions. And I guess in retrospect, I wish I would have chosen a different list. 
Um, it's just one of the official lists of the study. But now that I think about it, I kind of feel bad about using a list with so many negative uh, hateful emotions in there. But that's not, I didn't make up the list of words. I just, <laughs> the first one. Um, and so what we see is that everybody, almost everyone agreed that uh, bark was not seen, right? That didn't fit the theme. Uh, and it seemed like a word that wasn't given. And we all agreed that fear was seen. So there's a lot of agreement, right? We know what words were seen. So blue means seen, red means not seen. Why do you keep doing that? How do I make this just stay there? Let's try this. Does this make it big? Maximize. Right, let's put me up here. And so what we'll see here uh, is lots of agreement. Yes, we saw that. Nobody saw Apple. No one was confused by Apple. Yes, temper was a good one. Hatred was a good one. Uh, fury was a good one. But then we come to anger, which is the tricky one, because anger, of course, wasn't on the list. Uh, even though most of us, though not everyone, thought it was on the list. How many of you think that anger was on the list? I mean, most of you obviously do because the majority of us selected that. Um, I hope it wasn't on the list. <laughs> I know it wasn't on the list. So anger is a word that was related to the theme, related to the context, uh, but it's not one of the words that was actually shown to you. And so what the implication here is that we use our associations. We use our knowledge of what we were expecting to see uh, to recall the information later. How many of you were pretty convinced that anger would be, when you saw it, that it seemed like a good word, right? Um, of course, that's the right answer. I mean, the right answer is that anger should have been on that list, right? It's the theme word that's on that list. Uh, it is the gist, or it's kind of the central tendency. It's at the center. Uh, it's the word that kind of defines a lot of those other words. They're either synonyms for anger, or they're related to anger, or they're antonyms for anger. And so what happens is most of us think we saw that word. We know we didn't see apple. We know we saw temper and hatred, and we think we saw anger too. One of the possibilities is that as you see all of those words, how many of you even probably thought, oh, these are words that are kind of angry sounding words. I mean, that's what I would think. Uh, and that's the example of spreading activation, creating those links that aren't there. Your brain doesn't know the difference. All your brain knows is that you saw some angry words including experiencing the word anger. Even though you didn't read the word anger, you experienced the word anger when you created the connections uh, or noticed the associations. Now, this sounds like kind of a very mild false memory, right? It's not a very exciting kind of false memory. It's not like being convinced that you uh, carried out an elaborate plot against someone uh, or that you achieved some great thing, like that you ran a marathon when you didn't. Uh, or that you uh, failed an exam that you actually passed, or that you passed an exam that you actually failed, right? This is not trying to alter the space-time continuum. This is just, you thought you saw the word, and you were convinced you saw the word, and you answered yes to a recognition test for something that didn't happen. It's a mild kind of false memory, but it's the kind of false memory that underlies a lot of the other more sophisticated and maybe more damaging kinds of false memories. So just as a frame of reference, I've got about 15 more minutes of context. Can you all make it without the five minute break? Good, let's continue on. Um, this is known as the DRM task, the Dees, Rodiger, and McDermott task, uh, mostly because one researcher uh, whose name was Deese, uh, discovered the effect uh, in 1959. It was later uncovered uh, again in 1995 as a way to reliably induce false memories. In recognition, false memory to the lore, in other words, the words you did not see, is often as strong as accurate memory for target items. In our example, it wasn't quite as strong, right? There was some disagreement. There was a, about a quarter of you correctly said, no, I didn't see the word anger. But it's almost as strong as words that you did see. And so that's a definition of a false memory, uh, something that you think happened that didn't. Uh, the DRM task can reliably produce these false memories. 
Now, uh, the original, the secondary study, the one that was done in 1995 by Henry Rodiger and Kathleen McDermott, looked at this in a lot of different ways. Uh, their task was a lot more complicated. Uh, participants saw lots of different ways. So here's the anger list. Here's a list on bread, chair, black, cold, high, king. And each one of these, you can see that there's a gist. There's a central tendency. Sleep goes with bed, rest, awake, tired, dream, wake, snooze, blanket, doze, slumber, snore, nap, peace, yawn, and drowsy. Subjects shown that list of words falsely recognize sleep. Uh, and in their study, typically, typically subjects were asked to learn several lists of words. They were at, you know, learn each list, try to recall each list, uh, and then ask them to recognize these words. Later on, ask them if they had seen them. So they went through lots of different uh, variants uh, for each one of these. And but what they did was essentially what we did. Um, subjects were tested, in some cases, uh, in a regular class meeting, just like us. Uh, given lists of words, they were asked to rate sure that they knew it, or sure that it was new. And then later at the end of the entire experiment, the six particular lure items, most participants raised their hand indicating that they had seen them. So this can be reliably induced in very tightly controlled experimental settings like doing it uh, with a questionnaire or in front of a screen, but it can also be shown in fairly uncontrolled uh, settings like a classroom where participants simply read a list of words and then raise their hand to indicate whether or not they had seen it. What they found generally across all of these things is that for the critical lure, participants generally thought they saw it. In other words, 58% in this one study, in the first study, uh, gave it a rating of four, meaning they were sure it was an old word. Not as strong as the words they studied, but stronger than the words they didn't study. So it was activated by something. It was activated by that spreading activation. And as I've said before, your brain doesn't always know the difference. That's where the false memory comes from. Your brain is trying to make sense of everything as quickly as possible using schemas, using your knowledge, and using anything it can to try to reduce the cognitive processing load. And if you notice a list of words has a theme to it, like words doing having to do with anger, words having to do with uh, sleep, then your brain is going to try to fill in those gaps, right? It's going to say, I think I know what these words are because these are all sleep words. Uh, it reduces the amount of cognitive processing. Generally speaking, the less work your brain can do, the happier it is. Uh, sorry, what was the question? Oh, old and new is just the judgment. By old, four means that you were sure it was an old word, meaning it's sure that it's a word that you saw during the study phase. Whereas sure new means that you're sure that it's a new word that you did not see before. So higher numbers here indicate, yes, I remember it. Higher numbers here indicate, no, I did not uh, remember it. So 75% studied words, yes, I remember seeing it. Uh, Non-studied, unrelated new items they did not study, 80% uh, say, yes, that is a new word. Does that sound good? Let's continue on to the last example. So I wanted to talk about elaboration and integration and how this uh, can spark these uh, sort of distortion and intrusion errors. And I'll use the example that probably a lot of you are already familiar with, uh, which is uh, Loftus's uh, eyewitness uh, testimony examples. You probably studied this in Psych 1001 or Psych 1002. I'm not sure which section it's studied in now. So we elaborate and integrate in order to store information. So we take uh, into, you know, take into context and uh, we encode information about surrounding words, surrounding semantic context. And we try to elaborate on things uh, so that we can uh, help improve our memories. And we try to elaborate on things and use context to be able to predict what's coming next. Uh, this elaboration can also produce errors and I defined intrusion errors and distortion errors. And so these come from, there's several different terms here that you might want to remember. So in these eyewitness testimony examples, uh, Loftus and Palmer refer to this as a misinformation effect. In other words, it's the effect of information that is not present. It's a pretty straightforward experiment. Participants will see a short film clip of a car accident. 
kind of like we all saw a short photograph or a quickly presented photograph of a uh, student office, right? So you see something visual, not given much context around it. Uh, and then later you're asked questions about it. Uh, and what participants were asked is, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? This is a standard question you might be asked if you were a witness to an accident, right? Whether it's uh, the police asking the question or law or insurance adjuster asking the question, uh, this is a pretty straightforward question. How fast do you think these cars were going? Just estimate uh, how fast were they going when they hit each other? But other subjects might be asked the same question with a different description. How fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? And you can obviously see how one of these is going to encourage a different kind of reconstruction of the memory. Everybody sees the same video. Some people are asked with what sounds like a fairly mild uh, accident, they hit, it's kind of, it's not very uh, descriptive, but other people are asked with one that sounds a little bit worse when they smashed into each other. And what we should take from the Pritchard and Anderson example we did before is that even seeing the same information, when people are given a different context, they can remember different pieces of information. What Loftus is gonna suggest is that sometimes you remember things that didn't occur at all. So she asked, how fast were they going? They collided, smashed, bumped, hit, or contacted. And what she found was that people estimated different speeds based on the, on the uh, description they were used, they were asked with. The description that was used when they were uh, asked the question. The more violent sounding the words smashed, the faster the estimate. Contacted, only 31 miles an hour, smashed 40 miles an hour. This would be an example of a distortion error. They're remembering that the cars hit each other, but they don't remember exactly, I mean, they're estimating it, right? They don't actually know how fast the cars were going. Uh, so they use their basic information uh, from the context of the question. And they estimate a faster speed if it's smashed, a slower speed uh, if it's contact. Here's the interesting part. Later, a week later, participants were asked other questions. So now they've committed this to memory. They saw the video. They were asked how fast were the cars going when they smashed, contacted, or collided, or contacted, uh, or hit. Uh, and then they were asked, did you see broken glass? Was there broken glass in the video? And the correct answer, by the way, is no, there was no broken glass in the video. However, people who were asked with the word smashed were more likely to estimate uh, incorrectly or to falsely remember seeing broken glass. People who were asked with hit, only 14% thought they saw broken glass. People who were not given a question at all, a control condition where they just saw the video and then later were asked about broken glass, uh, only 12% said yes. So being asked with the wrong word distorts your memory and allows for an intrusion of something that wasn't really there. Loftus later went on uh, to become one of the most influential uh, memory experts in courtroom and forensic and trial settings, uh, because this has a lot of implications for eyewitness testimony, right? If you can't remember what happened, and if the questions can lead you to remember things that didn't happen, uh, it has, says a lot about the way in which you might be interviewed or investigated uh, or um, interrogated by police or by detectives uh, or by your lawyer or by another lawyer. And so as a result, uh, Loftus has often been called uh, to, as an expert testimony uh, for all kinds of uh, eyewitness uh, and uh, memory uh, cases that involve a specific person or a specific witness's memory. So people who heard smashed, that is a distortion error. People who recalled the broken glass, that's an intrusion error. These things often co-occur. And in Loftus's case, uh, it was the original uh, asking with the wrong term that then later colored the memory later on and caused the intrusions. 
Does that seem clear so far? Okay, just a few more topics uh, to cover. Uh, and all I wanted to do was elaborate on some of these issues. We tend to have overconfidence. So most of us are overconfident in our ability to be able to remember things. If I had asked you ahead of time, how many of these words do you think you would remember? Or when we did the list of the Dees Roder, when we did the Dees Rodiger McDermott list, if I were to ask you how confident you were that you'd be able to remember the right words, you'd likely be fairly confident, but maybe not perfect, right? If I asked you how likely would you be able to, how likely would you be to falsely remember stuff that didn't occur? Uh, you might be confident that you wouldn't falsely remember lists of words or that you wouldn't falsely remember objects uh, in the photograph. Uh, and there are a couple of reasons why we tend to be overconfident. I mean, for one thing, we tend to be confident in our own judgments because that's all we have to go on, right? It's, it's fairly adaptive as a human to be confident in your own judgments about what's in front of you and the predictions that you're making. Uh, we often remember information, but don't remember the exact source. So we have difficulty uh, with source memory. We remember something that happened, but we don't remember the person who said it. Um, we also tend to be confident uh, because if something comes to mind really quickly, uh, if something comes to mind really easily, you tend to be more confident in that judgment. So processing fluency uh, is another reason why we tend to be really confident and trust our memories. But that can lead people astray, of course. If something, if a false memory comes to mind really easily, uh, then you are attributing a lot of confidence to something that didn't happen. I mean, this kind of thing happens on exams all the time, doesn't it? You think I, how many of you have walked out of an exam thinking, I did pretty well. I got, all, you know, I got most of those. And then you look at your score and you think, I didn't do as well as, didn't do as, well as I thought, right? It does happen sometimes. Uh, the answers seem to come uh, to you really quickly, but they sometimes if they come too quickly, it can be a clue that they're uh, not the right answers. Because of this, we often have an inability to distinguish whether the original event or some later event was the source of the information. In other words, to use the examples we just were shown, uh, did you remember the word sleep on one of those lists because it was actually in the study list or because I thought about the word when I looked at the studies list. In Rodiger's experiments, uh, people were falsely remembering those words because they thought about them, not because they actually saw them. So yes, there was processing fluency, uh, but they misattributed the source. It was an internal source rather than an external source. Uh, or did I read that, you know, did I get that piece of information from something I read online that I saw in a movie or did my friend tell me about it? Most of us have that common experience. We remember something, but we don't remember where we read it, or where we saw it or who told it to us. So as a summary, our memory is far from perfect. Uh, a lot of the processes that aid our memory like context and knowing the meaning can also lead to these mistakes and errors. Intrusion errors happen because people remember things that didn't happen and distortion errors happen because we often remember a slightly different version of what actually did. Okay, before you go, just some upcoming, if I was right, I did finish in 15 minutes exactly. Um, upcoming information, quiz two is today at 5 p.m. The quiz will open up uh, and you can take it over the next 24 hours. You can take it until 5 p.m. tomorrow. One small change in the quiz from before, you now have 30 minutes to take the quiz rather than 20 minutes. It gives you a little bit more time. Actually, that lines up really well with the exam that's coming up. So don't go anywhere yet. I just want to talk a little bit about the exam. Wednesday, we're going to talk about concepts and categories. Somebody asked, there's no slides up for the Wednesday lecture. I have not completed the slides yet for the Wednesday lecture. They will be up soon. Um, today's material is on the quiz, but not Wednesday's. And then next Monday, we're gonna talk about knowledge representation. And then I'll also set aside some time for exam review. For that, I will revisit some of the material. I'll help, help to emphasize what's gonna appear on the exam and I can answer specific questions. For the exam itself, it's a two hour exam. It's right here in this classroom in person, uh, Nat Psi one. There are 60 multiple choice questions. 
which as I said, lines up pretty well. 15 minute questions for 30 minutes, 30 questions in 60 minutes, therefore 60 questions in 120 minutes. So the experience that you have taking the quiz is gonna be very similar to the experience you will have taking the exam, except you're gonna fill in dots instead of pressing. And you can go back and forth when you do it in person. So you can answer the easy ones first, go back and rechange. Yes. Monday's lecture. So the question is, is Monday's lecture on the exam? Yes. Monday's lecture is on the exam. Everything through October 27 will appear on the midterm. And then that's it. The final exam is all new material. So they're not cumulative. This will be our midterm exam. And then at least for this class, you can relax and enjoy uh, your vacation. All right. See you on Wednesday. Yes. Hold on, let me stop recording.